Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll wait a moment for everybody to come in here. Um, my name is Bill Lester. I'm with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Hernando County, Florida. And we're here today with Jamie Lynn Doherty, who is the new Hello. agent over in Lake County. And we're going to be talking all about um, getting your trees prepared for hurricane season, because believe it or not, we are in hurricane season right now. I know everything's hectic between COVID-19 and everything else, but you can't forget the hurricanes also. So, um, Jamie, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, let me get this here and, oh. All right, so y'all can just see the presentation, right? Yeah, I see it. Perfect, just wanted to make sure. All right, so today we're talking all about prepping trees for hurricanes and just to give you a quick brief about me so you know why it matters. Um, I've actually got about seven years of experience in urban and utility forestry and I've been a certified arborist for approximately 10 years. Um, now when I talk about arborists in here, I'm not the person you call to get tree work done, um, but I have information on that for you. So starting off with what we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to start off with terminology. I'm going to tell you about what to look for, a bit about proper pruning, when to call an arborist. Um, then we're going to talk about palms and in the terminology, you'll find out why palms are after everything. But the whole goal of this presentation is so that you have a better understanding of how to identify different tree issues and also know what you can handle and know when you really should just call a professional. So to start off, we have terminology. So branch bark attachment. This is the location where the trunk and a branch are attached to each other. Um, and the reason this is important is because you have different tissues coming at different angles. So if you look at the image, um, that arrow that just popped up, you can see uh, this is a tr part of a trunk and a branch that's been kind of cut back. So you can see the underneath and you can see that the tissue is actually kind of wrapping around that of what's on the far right, which is the um, that branch tissue coming out. Um, and it's important to make sure that you're always pruning to the proper um, branch bark attachment so that you allow the tree to actually heal properly. And we'll get more into that a little bit later. So next up we have included bark and this is a weak branch attachment. It usually starts when you have a co-dominant plant or if you have a V-shaped branch attachment, um, either in a branch or with a um, larger branch coming off of a main trunk. Um, and it's basically the equivalent of if you were to hold your arm, bend your arm at your elbow, bend your arm at the elbow and hold it there for a while. It's gonna get sweaty, it's gonna get gross, it's gonna get nasty. So if you have included bark, you're gonna have excessive moisture, dirt and um, pests and diseases can accumulate there and it can lead to a massive failure later on. So this, uh, I've got the arrow showing you right there. That's one of the things to look for with um, included bark. On this particular tree, it's co-dominant stems happening. So another term to, uh, we don't use it too much in this presentation, but it's a good one to know is drip line. Um, and the drip line literally is the area under a tree that you'll still get dripped on after a rain. So it goes all the way out to the edge of the canopy. And it refers to not only the tree uh, canopy itself, but also the ground under it, which usually has the most vital and important roots for the tree. So something else, just so you know. Um, so a node. Now this is another stem. This is uh, a stem, actually the last hurricane that came through in my yard. I had a bunch of extra wood that had fallen, so I was having fun. Um, so this is actually another little stem that has the bark all pulled back. So again, you can see how the vascular tissue moves around things. So a node itself is an area of growth and it can produce a stem, it could produce branches, leaves. Um, there's a lot of different things, but anytime when we talk about pruning, a branch bark attachment is a node um, and you wanna make sure that you're pruning and cutting to nodes in a lot of horticultural aspects. So here's two different nodes and in the front one that you can see, you can really see that vascular tissue kind of moving around that um, extra branch tissue and then that branch tissue is then separate. And it's important to note that because again, that separation is how trees can compartmentalize injury to actually heal. If you don't allow them to compartmentalize, 
they can get diseases and um, have failures later on. So when talking about hazards with trees, um, one of the words we use is target. And the target is basically what's it going to hit if it fails. And when I say about tree failure, it means breakage and it falls. Um, so in this case, this is a tree in a parking lot. And you can see that it's got that V-shape attachment again. So in this case, if the tree was to fall, does anybody have a guess as to what the target would actually be? Maybe you want to type it in the chat and somebody can tell me what it says. Do we get anybody? Yeah, can you read the chat? Oh, there it is. I got it now. Okay. It wasn't showing up for me. Cars. Yes, the example is cars. Now, can you guess which car? In this picture, if it failed right now, which car is most likely getting damaged? Yeah, the red car. So, and the reason you can tell that is because it has that slight lean to the left, and that lean also helps to indicate where things are likely going to fall. Now, if it's a hurricane, you're not too worried about this, but if you're parking your car in a parking lot, I always look up before I park under a tree. Um, and I suggest that everybody does that because it's, trees can fail at any point in time if there's just a weak branch or something happened in the past and you don't wanna be that person that was unlucky enough to be parked under the tree. Okay, so our final term is going to be arborescent. So arborescent means that it's tree-like in appearance, but it's not actually a tree. So to be a tree, it involves the, um, it's a cellular level of how everything's organized within the trunk. So some examples of arborescent plants, so they're tree-like, they're tall, they appear to be trees, but they're not true trees, they don't produce true wood. So palms fall under that category, bananas, um, and there are a few other large plants. Tree ferns are another one where they're tree-like, they're tall, but they're not a tree by official definition. All right, so moving on to things to look for. Um, so I'm gonna be going over loose and dead branches, branch, apart, branch attachments and included bark. I mentioned it before, I'll talk a bit, about, a bit more about it in a minute. Um, trunk lean, trunk damage, species um, and hazards. So for species, I'm just gonna mention a, three species um, that are common here and whether or not they're good for um, handling storms. So loose and dead branches is uh, pretty simple. If you look up in your tree and you see anything hanging or anything that looks dead, that's something that should be removed because it's more likely to fall out in a windstorm event of any kind. So here um, is actually one of this is my tree out front. I need an arborist to come out and help me too. Um, so you have these dead little snags, um, and there's a couple of things here. One, they're more likely to fall, but two, because they're not cut back to the proper node, they could actually allow disease to enter the tree that could cause more problems later on. Um, so if you see anything loose, um, if you're standing back from your tree and you see that there's dieback in the leaves, that's an indication that something needs to be fixed. Uh, a major thing if that's kind of a red flag is if you see most of the tree is green, but the very top of the tree is starting to die back. That indicates something seriously wrong with your tree, because if a tree is going to start dying yeah, um, this way, it's going to start at the top because the top's the hardest to get the nutrients to because of, you know, gravity and things. So it'll start dying at the top and it'll still look okay around the sides, but you need somebody to look at your tree if you see die back on the top. Okay, so branch bark attachment and included bark. Um, included bark is going to come up again in a little bit. Again, that's when the bark is touching, um, which you don't want, and V-shape attachments aren't great. So if you look at this particular tree, this is actually a V-shape attachment. What you normally want is a nice U, um, and this is a V, and this is actually a sycamore tree. So this has co-dominant stems. And what's going to happen is as those stems enlarge, you will eventually get included bark because that um, that angle down at that base that the air is pointing at is too small for them to be far enough apart for them to actually be able to stay there the whole time. Um, now, if this was your tree, you have two options. Take the whole thing out so you don't have problems later or select one of those leaders and take the other one off. Um, if you were to leave included bark, not do anything with it, 
this is what could happen and this doesn't have to wait for a storm event either it can just happen on a sunny day because finally the rot got all the way through um, now on this one you can't really see the rot it was actually on the other side and i forgot to get a better picture angle um, but this isn't something that you really want to walk out of your house or your business and see the tree just kind of has snapped. Um, not to mention if you've never heard a tree snap, it's kind of a terrifying sound if you're nearby. Now, included bark, unlike dying limbs, can be a little harder to see by just looking at the tree. So if we look at this live oak, it looks perfectly healthy. Canopy's nice, it's got a nice spread, it's had some bad pruning in the past because it's almost a little too cleaned up on some of the branches, but you know, it's not doing terrible. But if you drive around the corner and get a look at the trunk, you can see that it's got included bark all the way, almost all the way to the ground, and you can also see it starting to split up at the top. Um, if you were to drive a little bit further, you can actually see through that top about um, 18 inches. Now, if you had a tree like this, you can preserve it with cabling. Uh, but you do want to do something, either cable it or remove it, because that tree is going to snap in half at some point. Um, and in this case, it would just block them in their driveway. Uh, but if that, if the target is your house, that's something that you would want to uh, take care of. So not to neglect our pines. Most of the time, our pines in Florida are nice and straight, and they don't have um, a lot of funky branch attachments, but this one does. Um, and this one has this, again, strange V-shape attachment that isn't going to be a good um, strong attachment for that. And if this was on your property, you should really prune that one back so that the tree is actually more stable for handling storms. Um, pines are nice because most pines in Florida, they're super well adapted to hurricanes. They can bend really well and then bounce back up. Um, the exception is when you see Hurricane Michael because they could only bend so long before they literally just snapped because they couldn't, they just couldn't take the sustained winds for that amount of time. Um, but kind of your average hurricanes that aren't, you know, record breakers, they can usually handle it pretty well. Um, one thing to note about pines in general, if you see the needles starting to brown, that's a red flag because if you have lot, large amounts of browning, that indicates the tree is likely dying. And when pines die, they're really likely to fall once they start dying. Um, and you can't always tell where they're gonna fall because they're straight. So they're a little scary when you're kind of figuring out what's going on with those. Um, so yeah, brown needles, call somebody for um, some questions. So I mentioned trunk lean in the terminology. Here's another example of a trunk. I think it's pretty obvious it's gonna go to the left. Um, so anytime you're looking at a tree, when I was buying a house, I kept looking at the trees and doing inspections on them, but you want to look at where the tree is leaning and where it's most likely to fall. So if you're buying a house and the tree is leaning away from the house, you're probably fine. It's unlikely that the tree is going to fail and fall on your house. But if it's the flip side and a tree is leaning towards your house, then that's something that you want to remove right away because in the event that it did fall, it would actually be hitting your home. So trunk damage. So in this picture, we have not only trunk damage, but also a target to talk about. So this is actually a pecan tree and it is located at a junction point of two heavily trafficked pathways um, on, that are normally relative, like I said, relatively active. Um, and for whatever reason, the people that manage this area don't want to remove this tree. Uh, but when you look at it closer, you can see all of the cavities in the tree and dead branches. So when you have cavities in the tree, that indicates there's been rot. Um, and when you have cavities, that means the tree's not necessarily as safe to be around. Now, if this tree was in the forest, no problem. Great habitat for things. But when you have a target that could be caused loss of life, you want to remove this so that you don't have that um, as a liability. Another thing to look for as a red flag in palms as well as um, our hardwood trees we're talking about is if you have these conchs. So these are fruiting bodies of fungi. They're never a good sign to see these on the side of a tree. It indicates rot um, and it indicates that you may have um, a significant issue with your tree and that you will need to see about getting it removed. 
So talking a little bit about tree species, um, the first one up is the southern live oak. This is a native tree and this has evolved and adapted to hurricanes. They can usually handle them pretty well, especially if they're allowed to grow like this picture is showing you because that's sort of more of the natural habit. And the neat thing here is you can see the three trunks. And so if you have lots of live oaks kind of growing together, they still make that shape that you would get if it was a single trunk. Um, which is just fascinating. But normally live oaks want to have kind of elbows on the ground. So they have those low branches that will sit on the ground and that helps to stabilize them. That also means if you have live oaks on your property, obviously odds are pretty good. You're not letting the elbows stay on the ground and you don't even have a tree with that kind of form. So you need to be a little bit more cautious about what's going on because the tree doesn't have all of the stability in um, a home environment. Um, now, I know that some people get scared of live oaks because they see the tree and it fell over and the whole um, root plate came up with it. That's actually not a tree failure in most cases, it's a soil failure, and that's impossible to predict um, because what happens there is the soil just gets so incredibly saturated with water. Between that and the wind, the roots just literally have nothing left to hold on to and it falls over. So it's different than roots giving way if that makes sense. And it's unfortunate because it's one of the things that scare people the most, but it is not a predictable um, thing. That's why looking at trunk lean is the best option there because you can say, well, if we had a soil failure, it's going to fall this way. That's really the best that you can do. So next up, we have a camphor tree. This was a pretty popular tree for a while, planted as an ornamental. So we have some relatively large trees in people's yards now. This is actually an invasive. So, um, you know, if you've been wanting to remove that tree in your front yard for a while, don't feel bad about it because it is an invasive tree and you don't really want them around. And I hate saying that because I do, I think they're very pretty as a tree, uh, but again, invasives, you don't want to keep them around. But another downside about camphers is they're really weak when it comes to storms. Um, so they're not well adapted for this environment. And if you have one, it's more likely to have failures during a storm. So another species is um, the ear tree, and I don't have the whole habit showing, I just have the seed because that's the easiest way to really identify this. So if you've ever seen that seed pod in your yard, that means you have an ear tree nearby. Now ear trees are another invasive. They were planted as part of the ornamental trade because they have pretty flowers, but they have relatively weak branch attachments and they don't hold up well in storms at all. I have seen these just snap like twigs um, after storms and they're not, they're not something I ever want to have in my yard. So it's something that you would want to take a really close look at if you have one because they are more likely to fail than some of the other trees that we have. So I've talked a lot about the hazards um, and I've talked a lot about targets. So with targets, there's two main ones. So if it can result in the loss of life, that's your number one priority to make sure that that's safe. The second one is, um, structures. So it would be things like sheds or empty buildings. So it's structural damage that can happen, but not including loss of life. So if it's over an active trail, that's loss of life. If it's over a house, it's loss of life. Um, so if you have an arborist come out and look at your trees to give you a hand, one of the things they're looking at is what's the hazard? What's the target? You know, what can I do to make sure that people and property are actually safe? All right, I don't think I've seen anything come up as far as questions so far. So uh, we're gonna move on to now what, which is pruning. So the proper way to prune something involves a three cut method. You want your first cut to actually be an undercut somewhere around 12 inches from the actual end point of your cut. So in this particular picture, it shows the trunk of the tree. It's not always going to be the trunk of the tree. It could be a node somewhere else on a branch. Uh, but you want that cut about 12 inches from the final cut. And the reason is when you make that second top cut, if something happens and the branch starts to bend, it's not going to snap and then rip the bark down because that's a significant injury for a tree and you don't want that. So you do that undercut first to protect. The secondary cut takes most of the weight off and then your final cut is going to be right at that nice branch bark attachment um, for proper healing ability afterwards. Okay. 
And I have um, an example here with some, like an actual tree. So we have on the tree, it's written yes and no for the pruning cut. So if this was a final cut, you would want the cut to be there. And you can see it's at that angle with that branch um, attachment. And we have no listed where it would be what's called a flush cut. So we don't like flush cuts. Flush cuts actually remove a lot of the material that is used to actually heal wounds. So unlike people, so when we get a cut, when we heal, we our cells stitch together and it's like it's brand new. But trees don't do that. They don't heal the actual injury. They heal over the injury and kind of hide it. So you want to make sure that you allow the tree to have the cells it needs to actually do that. And you want to make sure you have the proper angle cut for that. So next up, I just have a couple of examples of bad pruning so that one, you're aware of it and two, you can avoid it. So if you're hiring an arborist and you ask them where they've pruned in the past and you can take a look at it, these are some things you wanna not see. Let's see, I see a question. Large and uh, established trees with slime flux and advance on how to prune live oak with two main trunks. Um, Rachel, I like your question. Uh, my email address is at the end. I'm going to need to see pictures of it to better help tell you what you might need to do for that, okay? So I had a question come in um, regarding slime flux in established trees. She has an oak tree with two main trunks. Um, and with most things with trees, it's a lot easier to tell you guys, uh, give you advice if I can see the pictures. Um, because I don't want to tell you something and then find out later that that was wrong because I didn't know the whole picture. Okay, so so lion tailing is a huge no. So what lion tailing is, is it's basically kind of like shaving the legs of a tree is how my mom puts it. Um, so it makes the tree more susceptible to wind damage because you have nothing there to help disperse the wind. So when wind hits a tree, right, the tree starts to shake to take on that extra movement. That movement then moves through different areas in the tree until it's dispersed ideally through the ground. But if you take away all of those extra little branch attachments in the center of the tree, there's nowhere extra for that movement to go and it gets concentrated and results in a more likely chance of having large branches break over time because there's, again, nowhere for it to go. Um, so if you ever think about it, like if you have a kite outside and the wind comes and grabs it and it like jerks you backwards, that's what's happening here. You have this sail up at the top of the tree but you don't have anything really to help keep it attached to the tree if the wind gets a little bit too hard, if that makes sense. All right, so topping is another horrible thing to do to trees. So what topping does is this is topping where you basically just indiscriminately cut the tree to remove the canopy. Now what happens is when those um, trees start to grow back, you get these kind of water spouts, really close branch attachments, really poor branch attachments, which means that those are more likely to fail in a storm or just in everyday life. So if you have something on your property that's been topped in the past, you wanna take a close look at it. You may wanna end up just removing the whole plant and starting fresh. I actually have four crepe myrtles on my property that I'm going to be taking out because they have been topped for too many years. They have horrible branch attachments. They don't look nice. Um, so I'm gonna take them out and start over to get a nice single trunk um, crepe myrtle tree that can then not only handle the weather, but also will look nicer as it ages. Um, but yeah, topping, again, is that indiscriminate um, chopping up of a tree to just kind of remove the entire canopy. Um, for some reason, over in Europe, a lot of their urban uh, forestry practices involve completely topping, um, and there are fun debates between American arborists and European arborists um, about it. But for the most part, everybody agrees topping results in horrible branch attachments. Um, there is a legitimate uh, pruning method called pilarding that looks like topping, but it's going back to a specific location every time. 
Um, and if you want more information about that, you can email me or I'm sure I'll have another presentation uh, with more information about that later. So I mentioned flush cuts. So flush cuts are bad. And this is actually a very large cut. This was in a neighborhood I used to live in. And I can tell you from driving by, this is actually across the street from that live oak I showed you. There was no reason that I saw for this particular limb to get cut. And it's a very large limb to just kind of be like willy nilly, I'm gonna cut that limb off. Um, Cause it's a huge wound for the tree to heal. But you can see this actually isn't cut properly. It's cut mostly straight down. It's not cut at the proper angle. And if we turn this over so you can look head on, do you happen to notice anything else that's wrong with this tree that's a concern? It's something you learned about on this presentation already. Cracking. Okay, it's cracking, but uh, what was that called? It's not exactly cracking. So you have like two branches coming together. The bark's inclusion, exactly. That included bark. And it looks like I might have a couple of other questions. Um, so I have a question here. Is there liability issues when Laurel Oak that has a target of a house? Um, if you're the arborist and you know it's a problem and you don't inform the homeowner, then yes, it's a liability issue. Um, if you're the homeowner and you know it's an issue for your house, technically it's not a liability issue um, because you're not qualified to remove the tree. Um, but that's an interesting question. Hopefully I covered that one. It's liability with trees can get a little bit confusing. Um, let's see. Should some, oh, that's a great, okay. So in the comments, John wrote, should somebody put something on the cut of the limb like tar? The answer is no. You don't want to actually cover cuts that you make on a tree, especially with tar. So if you think about where fungal spores are going to bloom, it's going to be nice, moist, dark locations. And there's fungal spores all around us, right? So the second you cut that tree, there's fungal spores attached to it, right? So they're in there and they can start kind of working at getting into the tree. If you coat it with tar, even if the tar says it's antifungal, you've just made a great habitat for that fungus to actually spread. And you've also made it impossible for the tree to heal itself. So what you wanna do is do a proper pruning cut and let the tree heal. That's gonna be 100% better than sticking tar on it. Um, there was another tree in this neighborhood that actually split that I hadn't been expecting. It wasn't one I was kind of eyeing on my drive home. Um, literally half the tree fell down. They cleaned it up, slapped tar on it, but now this tree is leaning this way over the neighbor's house. So that's a liability issue because now it's, if it falls, they can technically um, go after their neighbor. But yeah, so on this one, it is that included bark that we have right there. It looks like we have maybe a couple more questions. Let me see. Oh, neighbor's Laurel Oak with the target of your house. Okay, that would definitely be a conversation that you need to have with your neighbor. Um, and since the target's your house and it's on their property, perhaps you guys wanna talk about sharing the cost of the removal um, to kind of soften the blow because then it limits it being a problem for your house and it's more likely that your neighbor is going to, you know, be acclimating to that request. Um, and you can always have an arborist come out and say, yeah, that is a problem too. But hopefully a conversation with your neighbor would be enough, at least to get it started. All right. So all this information about pruning. So homeowners and pruning safety. Um, PPE is that personal protective equipment. And anyone working on a tree a that you hire is required to wear this while they're working. So even city officials, I actually had some city officials that came out to prune my tree in the right of way. Um, and I am a certified arborist. So I went out and was like, hey, what are you guys doing? And they're like, oh, we have all this stuff. And I said, but where's your hard hats? Like, where are your safety vests? Where are all these things? And they just kind of looked at me kind of crazy um, because none of the city employees had hard hats on at all. 
and uh, they didn't have a work zone set up and there's different things that are required when you have people working on trees. So as a homeowner, these are some things for you to consider. One is you do need a hard hat that's going to stay on your head. Um, you don't want to look up and have it go flying off. You need hearing protection, especially if you're using chainsaws. Um, you need protective glasses or a shield. I usually just wear my protective um, safety glasses. Um, you want gloves. If you're using a chainsaw, you need chaps and you want some sort of heavy work boot. So if something falls on your foot, you're not going to lose it. Um, now, unless you know how to use a chainsaw, don't use a chainsaw. Uh, because if they're not maintained properly, the chain can literally break, snap back, and cause serious injury and or death. Um, and I've been in enough trainings where they've had to say, if you're squeamish, avert your eyes, we're showing you a chainsaw injury, to know you don't want that to happen to you or a loved one. So you only want to work from the ground. You don't want to work with ropes. You don't want to work with ladders. You don't want to climb the tree. You're not, if you're not trained in it, don't do it. Um, one other thing, a lot of homeowners don't know, you should never use a chainsaw above your shoulder, so you should never use it up here. Um, and there's several reasons for that. One is you can have debris flying back in your face that can potentially harm you or get in your eyes. If the chainsaw um, chain breaks, it's going to slash back on your head, which is hugely problematic. Um, and then also the limb that's falling could injure you because you're going to cut that limb and it's going to fall somewhere and your hands are both on a chainsaw, so you can't do anything about it. Um, never ever prune near any power lines. You need um, arborists that are, have special certifications in that. Um, and even if you think, I can do that, it's not gonna hit, you have to be careful with power lines. Um, if you happen to be trying to trim something near a transmission line, the electricity can arc without the tree even touching the line and it can result in death. Um, and then even the lines that are coded, the distribution lines near your homes, those can also kill you if it's not done properly. So if you have trees and power lines, 100% get the professionals for those. Um, and generally, if this has made you feel completely overwhelmed, call the professionals. Okay, so why are you going to call? So certified biologists, uh, certified arborists are trained in tree biology and they're also trained in safety. So they know how to look at a tree and see what could happen long-term with it. They also know how to get information from you about the past to figure out what problems may be going on with the tree now or in the future based on things that happened earlier on. Because trees are really long-lived and something that happened 10 years ago could be the reason for the failure now. So when you call an arborist, there's a few things you want to check. You want to check the, the certification. So you want to go to the ISA website, which is on the next slide, and confirm that their certification number is active, that they are up to date in everything that they need. You want to make sure they have insurance. You want to ask them about a couple of safety standards. It's the ANSI Z133.1 and the A300. Um, that's because any quote you get should have the work specified um, very specifically what they're doing and then also that it's being done to those standards. Um, and things like ANSI standards would be me saying exactly how you were supposed to do that pruning cut. Um, if someone ever mentions topping, don't even bother hiring them because they may have gotten the certification but they are not doing proper practices. Um, as ISA does not condone topping of trees at all. Um, now, sometimes people will come up and say, well, I'm licensed and insured. Well, they can say they're licensed, but that might mean they have a driver's license. ISA certification and certified arborists, they would never say they were licensed. They would say they were certified. Now, not all states require a certification, and Florida is one of them. They don't require it, but it's better if you have that certification because it shows that they have that extra level of education and professionalism that they went on, they got the certification, and you can feel more comfortable knowing that they're doing things right. Now, if all you're doing is removing a tree, as long as they're insured, that's fine. But if you're dealing with a living tree that you want to live for a while, I always recommend sticking with an arborist. So for finding a certified arborist, you can look at the International Society of Arboriculture. There's um, a website and some phone numbers, um, a few other, in bits of information you can look at. Um, but yeah, you can always look up a certification number and find out where they're at. You can also search in your area to see who's certified so you can call someone.
And I'm going to turn over the next bit over to Bill. Okay, great. And I just want to make mention that for anybody in Hernando County, if they contact our office, we do have a list of uh, certified arborists in the county that we, I mean, we don't recommend one arborist over another, but we kind of saved you a few minutes and made the list and we could put you in touch with them. So I'm going to kind of change directions a little bit here and talk a little bit about palm trees. And Jamie was talking all about different hardwood trees. Palm trees are very, very different. Palm trees are more closely related to grasses than they would be to uh, an oak tree or a maple tree. So because they're not actually trees, they're gonna to need to be managed and dealt with a little bit differently. Something very important you need to remember about palm trees is they only have one growing point or a meristem. So Jamie mentioned uh, with other trees, they have nodes, which is where the branches, additional branches come out from the trunk. And it could be either a very strong connection, a very weak connection, they could split. Palm trees only have one growing point and that's at the very top, at the very center. Now, if something happens to that growing point, your palm tree will die because that's the only place that it can grow from. And unfortunately, there's an awful lot of bad information and poor care out there. All I have to do is just hop in my car and drive through the neighborhood to see palm trees that are managed terribly, pruned terribly. Um, a lot of times it's by professional services um, well, obviously they're not very professional if they're not pruning palm trees correctly. And when it comes to caring for a palm tree and preparing a palm tree to be ready for when a hurricane hits, the best plan of action is to just manage your palm trees correctly. And that way they're always healthy, they're always in good shape, and they're always going to be able to weather a storm because palm trees have been in Florida a lot longer than we have been. Palm trees don't need us to prune them and primp with them and mess with them for them to be able to survive a hurricane. They've been doing that for thousands and thousands of years before we came along with all of our equipment and chainsaws and everything else. So learning how to care for a palm tree and manage it correctly is going to be the best way to prepare it for surviving a storm. Okay, next slide. So obviously, um, and I'm involved in a lot of different Facebook groups, and I'll see people post pictures of a palm tree that is completely dead, and they're asking, you know, what can I do to save my palm tree? Should I fertilize it with Epsom salts or spray neem oil on it or some, you know, wacky thing? If a palm tree is completely dead, it needs to be removed because it will eventually fall down. So dead palm trees don't recover and come back to life. This picture here is um, from just outside the county courthouse in Hernando County in downtown Brooksville. And we do have a number of different palm tree diseases in central Florida. Uh, this one right here is a bad case of lethal bronzing, which can affect uh, several different types of palms, primarily cabbage palms. So if you have a palm tree that has developed a disease, and you're wondering what it could be, or if you have to send a sample off for testing, just contact our office. But many of these palm tree diseases, there are, is no cure, there is no protection. If your palm tree gets it, unfortunately, it's gonna die and it's gonna need to be removed. So dead palm trees need to be removed. There's not a whole lot you could do to save them or make them recover or make them better. After a palm tree dies, it tends to break down fairly quickly. Now out in the woods, it's absolutely wonderful for wildlife. Um, woodpeckers will make homes in it. Other animals will use it for a home. But if it's in your yard or especially near your house or driveway or where it might injure people, if it's dead, you need to get it removed. Enough said. So next slide. Now palm trees are different from hardwood trees because Jamie showed a lot of pictures of oak trees and other types of trees where um, they've suffered a lot of damage to the trunk. And for hardwood trees, that can be a fatal injury. So what's going to happen is a rot is going to start to move into the trunk and it gets in the center of the trunk. 
And a lot of times it can be deceiving because your tree can look just fine from the outside, although all it has is a very small injury on the trunk. But inside of the tree, now it has a great big hollow dead area and it makes it very unstable and unsafe. Well, palm trees, because they're not hardwood trees, can handle a lot of damage to their trunks. I've seen a number of pictures that people have sent to me asking, you know, is my palm tree gonna die? I have this damage to the outside. This is a picture from um, the base of a Sylvester palm tree that's right out in my front yard. And when we bought the house, I have no idea what happened to it years ago, but somehow it was damaged the trunk was damaged right down near the ground at the base of it. And the tree looks great. It's very, very healthy. Now, one little side note of this, this has created a weak spot right down at ground level. And that damage, that big hole in the trunk is on the south side of the tree. So if I get a really, really strong wind from the north or a microburst or a hurricane comes along and spins up a little bit of a tornado nearby. If I get really, really strong winds from the north, that palm tree, there's a very good chance that it could snap and fall right over because now it has a weakened point at the base. But as far as long-term palm tree health, whether that palm tree is gonna die or not, it's the healthiest one I have in the yard. And I don't know why, you know, with that kind of damage, it seems to be doing just fine. So palm trees can suffer some pretty bad looking damage in the trunk and still get by just fine. So next picture. Here I have a couple of um, examples uh, starting on the right. That's the base of a Washingtonia palm that I have growing in my backyard. And you can see there's a lot of damage to what we would call bark. Technically on a palm tree, it's not bark. I believe it's pseudo bark. So it's the outer covering to the trunk on the palm tree and it's cracked and there's pieces chipping off. You can see um, uh, additional adventitious roots sprouting from the trunk of the palm tree, which is totally normal. That's just a palm tree kind of thing. Um, so the palm tree technically on the right is just fine. There's no issues with the bark. There's no long-term um, health issues to the palm tree with that. On the left is a picture that somebody just recently sent me and palm trees do what we refer to as just weird palm tree things. They'll start to send out roots from above ground. This is a little unusual because this is almost waist high and it's trying to send out a cluster of additional roots that doesn't hurt the tree. It's a little unsightly. Most homeowners don't think it's very attractive. Uh, you can see that a big piece of the pseudo bark or outer covering has uh, broken off. Technically that's not a health hazard or health issue with that palm tree. But in the center here, we have a young oak tree somebody sent me pictures of. And what this ended up being was they had sprinklers in their yard. And the sprinkler was pointed towards this oak tree and a few others. So every time they ran their irrigation, that uh, oak tree trunk was just getting blasted by the sprinkler. Every time the sprinkler passed by, it was blasting it. It damaged the bark, it got water soaked, it started to crack and fall off. Now for a young oak tree, that is a serious health concern. That is serious damage. There's a very good chance that that tree is gonna to start to rot through the trunk and that's gonna become a major weak spot and will kill the tree. All the above ground growth is gonna turn brown and die. Whereas palm trees getting similar damage, it's not a big issue. So palm trees are a little bit different. Okay, next slide. So folks, please don't do this. There's something out there that's called hurricane pruning and a lot of services, people who might knock on your front door and offer to trim your palm trees for you, do this regularly. There are a lot of commercial services that do this for um, shopping centers and office buildings and um, subdivisions. You know, they take care of the palm trees out at the very front of the subdivision. This is absolutely horrible for a palm tree from a plant health perspective. The reason behind that is palm trees, normally, as I mentioned earlier, that growing tip at the very top center is where the new growth, the new leaves come from. The oldest leaves over time are gonna turn tan, they're gonna turn brown, they're gonna die. 
And when they are totally brown, they can be pruned off. That's just, that's fine from a palm tree health perspective. But as they're dying and turning brown, all the nutrients in that leaf are being moved to the new leaves. So if you keep cutting off only half brown leaves, you're removing a lot of nutrients from the palm tree and that's gonna make the palm tree weaker and sicker over time. If you're removing healthy green leaves from a palm tree, that's gonna make it weaker over time also. A palm tree, depending on what species it is, is only gonna produce a certain number of new leaves every year. And if you remove more leaves than it's making, it won't be able to perform photosynthesis, it won't be able to feed itself, and long-term, the palm tree just gets sicker, weaker, much more susceptible to disease, a lot more susceptible to insect attack. Uh, we do have certain beetles that can get into palm trees and kill them. There's nothing really you could do for them after they get affected. So this is just the absolute worst possible way to prune and maintain a palm tree. Okay, next picture. And of course, like Jamie kind of alluded to, safety first, you don't wanna do this. This is from, believe it or not, professionals. What they have out there is a forklift and the gentleman there with the gas powered pruner is standing on a pallet on a uh, mobile forklift and he is pruning palm trees. And I can tell from just a quick glance, they're taking off too many leaves on those palm trees. He has no uh, protective gear on. Very important, if you are gonna prune your own palm trees, there are certain species of palm trees that have very, very large, very sharp spikes on the leaves. Washingtonia palms are a very, very good example, which I have several in my backyard. If you've ever pruned dead branches or dead leaves off a of Washingtonia palm, they have brutal um, spikes on them. So when you prune them and that leaf comes down, should it hit you in the head and you don't have a helmet on, it could very, very seriously injure you. Palm trees, because they're out in the environment, get dirt and bacteria and bugs and all kinds of nasty things on the leaves. So if you're pruning a palm tree, a Washingtonia, and you get stabbed in the arm by one of those spikes, there is a very, very good chance that you're gonna develop a very nasty infection because we don't know what is on the outside of that sharp spine on the leaf. So you need to wear protective gear, even with palm trees. You need to wear a helmet because if one of those leaves comes down and pokes you in the head, that might end up being a trip to the emergency room and we don't want to do that nowadays, especially. So this is definitely not the recommended way of uh, pruning palm trees from a safety point of view. Okay, next slide. So now if we're talking about palm trees and how they deal with high winds, so let's say a tropical storm or a hurricane is coming, if palm trees could not handle hurricanes all on their own, they would have gone extinct many, many years ago. And keep in mind, cabbage palms are a native palm here in Central Florida. So they've been living here a lot longer than we have. They don't need us to keep them pruned and hurricane pruned for them to survive. They can do it all on their own. And researchers have found that palm trees, when they're exposed to very high winds, because I keep mentioning that the one growing point on a palm tree is that meristem at the very top center. In high winds, if you leave a decent number of leaves on the palm, the palm leaves will actually fold up and over that growing point and help protect it from any debris or stuff blowing in the wind or just the high winds themselves. So palm trees, if all you do is just remove the totally dead leaves from them, they will fold up in a hurricane and protect themselves really, really well. So researchers have compared unpruned or very lightly pruned or maintained palm trees from ones that have been hurricane cut and the lightly pruned ones have a much higher survival percentage. In fact, hurricane pruning is so bad for palm trees from a plant health standpoint that in many South Florida counties, it is illegal to hurricane prune them. So if county code enforcement in Palm Beach County, um, Miami-Dade, and I think Broward counties, don't quote me on that, but I believe those are the counties that have ordinances. 
if they drive by your house and you have a hurricane prunes palm tree, they will find the homeowner and the service that did it. So very bad from a plant health perspective because over pruned and sickly and half dead palm trees are much, much more dangerous than a properly pruned palm tree in a hurricane. So next slide. So when a hurricane comes, we want you to be like cashmere here and at home in front of the TV, obviously not worried, not a bit concerned with his trees or palm trees because he's done all the groundwork and prepared them in advance and he's all set and obviously entirely too comfortable on the couch when the big storm hits. So uh, if you guys have any other questions, let me go down here to chat and see if there's any questions for me. Um, I answered them while you were talking. Okay, great, thank you. Wow, you're, you're really good at this. I appreciate that. You're welcome. So uh, University of Florida has a ton of information when it comes to palm trees. Uh, two of the most important things that you can do for your palm trees year round to keep them healthy and in good shape so when a storm does come, you could be like cashmere here and just sound asleep on the couch. Fertilize them with a quality palm fertilizer because palm trees have certain um, uh, uh, micronutrient needs that need to be met. So you really wanna fertilize them with a palm tree fertilizer because they are um, developed and mixed so that they have all those micronutrients in them. Don't fertilize your palm trees with turf fertilizer or if you have palm trees that are out and they're surrounded by turf grass, keep that turf fertilizer well back from your palm trees because turf fertilizer has way too much nitrogen in it. And that's very, very bad for palm trees. That on its own can make your palm tree um, sickly and kill it over a period of a few years. And when you're pruning your palm tree, only remove totally brown dead leaves. Leave the half dead ones, the partly dead ones on the tree to give them a chance to move all the nutrients from them into the new leaves of the palm tree. And if you do those two things, you're halfway there towards having healthy palms and palms that can withstand hurricane force winds. All right, Bill, we've got a couple of questions coming in. So uh, Rachel was asking me, um, I spoke about native trees and their tolerance to storms. Uh, we have, they have some Florida cherry trees throughout the yard. Um, and if they'd be safe to keep or should be removed. Um, that really just has to do with what the target would be if they were to fail. If they fall and all they're going to hit is your yard, there's no reason to take them out in advance. Um, you're welcome to send me some pictures and I can tell you um, what I think from there. But um, it, again, it just depends on what the actual um, target would be. Then John asked, should I trim old attachments so the trunk is smooth? The answer is no. You don't want to trim the attachments for the trunk to be smooth. You want, but you can trim any old attachments um, to the proper pruning location. Let me put my video back on. So you want to prune back to that proper point. So you can have maybe a little snag that needs cut back, but you never want it to be smooth. You want those angles by the trunk. Um, and let me throw in if John and I'm not sure if he's referring to a hardwood or a palm tree or if anybody else is wondering about the um, little old stumps on a palm tree they're called boots which is where leaves from you know one two three or ten years ago were pruned off generally leave the boots on they will fall off over time on their own and like I mentioned palm trees do kind of weird palm tree things a lot of palm trees will reach an age where they become what we call self-cleaning. And all of a sudden, over six months, all those old boots will boom, fall off the tree. And you gotta go out there and rake them up and clean them up. Just the best thing to do is let the boots fall off by themselves. If one is kind of loose and hanging halfway there, you can pull it off, but you don't wanna rip them off or trim them off because that leaves a fresh cut and fresh damage on the trunk or the bark or the covering of the tree, and you don't want to do that. So just let the old boots, the palm tree will hit an age where it just lets all them drop off on its own. That's usually the best thing to do with the palm. 
All right, there's another question about prepping lychee trees for hurricanes. Um, and one thing to keep in, in mind- South Florida. Huh? Lychees are a fruit tree in South Florida. They are. Well, one thing to keep in mind, if you have a big hurricane coming and you have a fruit tree, is make sure you get some fruit off of that tree so you don't have flying projectiles. Um, so if you have anything that's just about right, pull it off. And if you have a lot of fruit on it, you might consider pulling it off and accepting that you won't get the harvest just because certain, um, not necessarily for lychee because they're pretty small, but like avocado trees, those avocados are just missiles in a hurricane. Um, but as far as anything else, it would just be the same hurricane prep for any hardwood tree, making sure you have good branch attachments um, and that you have anything dead or loose out of the tree. Okay, yeah, I can't think of anything specific for lychees or avocados or mangoes in South Florida. Um, definitely removing any dead branches, maintaining them. I know those trees are normally pruned to a certain extent in South Florida anyway, because they grow like crazy down there. And John asked for queen palm, how should the seed pods be removed properly? That's a really good question, and I forgot to mention that that with any palm tree, palm trees are on occasion gonna flower. And they send up that great big flower spike. And then after it's done flowering, they turn to seeds. Um, different species of palms have different size seeds. Those things can be removed at any time. It's not gonna hurt the palm tree. But one little side note with palms, especially if they're flowering very early in the spring, uh, native bees and honeybees really love those flowering spikes on palm trees. And for cabbage palms, uh, that's very important for our native bees, a source of pollen and nectar, especially very early in the spring. Sometimes it might be the only thing in your neighborhood that's flowering that early. What I try to do is leave the flowers on and let the bees just have a field day up there. If you stand on the ground and look up, you will just see every species of native bee in your neighborhood up there feeding on those flowers. And then when it's totally done flowering, like right when it's setting seeds, that's when I prune it off. Because if you leave it be and it develops for a queen palm, the seeds, the little fruits, they're all gonna fall off. It's gonna make a huge mess. If you have gopher tortoises in, the na in your neighborhood, they do eat them. We have a gopher tortoise. And of course, I'm always behind on maintaining my queen palm and it help, comes over and helps me out with the fallen fruit. But it is totally safe from a plant health perspective to remove the flowers and fruits at any time. Okay, I don't see any other questions either in the chat or in the q and A. I I don't either. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we, like I said at the very beginning, we are recording this, so we're going to um, have this video available soon, most likely on Facebook, so definitely keep your eyes open for that. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to send the tree questions to Jamie Lynn. Uh, any palm tree questions or Bernina County questions, feel free to send them to me, and uh, with that, we thank you very much.